Hi, welcome to Invisible Church. I'm Pastor Tim Smith from St. Paul's Lutheran Church in New Ulm, Minnesota. And we've been studying 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Last time we got to around verse 14 or 15, and we are going to pick it up there tonight. I wanted to review just a couple of things, which begin with, I can't uh, get this thing to oh, hide. There we go. Uh, projecting, yes. The resurrection of Christ. First verses or so, which begins with an Old Testament testimony. And Brad, is that what I sent you for Bible Basics last weekend? Is that list of passages with the Old Testament testimony? Okay. And the eyewitness testimony as well. We remember last time talking about the 500 brothers and others who saw the risen Christ. This is followed by the section we're in tonight, which is the resurrection of the dead. And Paul's going to talk about some conclusions from false contentions and the meaning of the resurrection for us. And that will be followed, I believe, next time by the resurrection body with some comparisons and conclusions. And if you've been to a funeral uh, in the last hundred years, a lot of passages from that section of 1 Corinthians 15 um, that we use at the graveside in particular. And I wanted to ask a question to begin with, which is, what's the difference between the resurrection of Christ and, say, my resurrection, the resurrection of other people? And is there any difference? And the answer is there are actually a couple differences, maybe two. Um, the first one is the resurrection of Christ is part of his state of exaltation. My resurrection is not part of his state of exaltation, and it's just my resurrection. And do we remember the steps of the exaltation of Jesus? Maybe we should say the steps of humiliation and exaltation. Should I say them along with my hand as if I'm going up and down steps, as if I'm one of those modern divas who can't find a note without her hand in the air? Sorry, I just have a thing about that. But uh, 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 so if we begin together with he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. Can I stop there? Why do we mention Pontius Pilate in the creed? Herb? Historical. historical fact. Yeah. Uh, I, I, uh, I know of a, of, a, of, a, of a girl named Athena. She's named after a goddess who, the, anybody know the, the legend of how Athena came to be? She hurtled from her father's forehead, fully armored and fully grown. So, pow, there we go. Not sure what that did to Zeus's uh, cranium, but anyway, bang. And, and can you put a date on that, please? No, you can't put a date on that. But can you put a date on when Jesus was crucified and yeah because Pilate was only governor for 10 10 10 years um about uh, 26 to 30 AD so in there is when Jesus was crucified historical date okay suffered under Pontius Pilate crucified died and was buried. now the next step is it part of the exaltation or the humiliation exaltation and what is that step descended into hell wait heard descended means goes down and exaltation means goes up what's going on okay excellent excellent spoken like a true middle school teacher thank you Herb. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you were patient with me when you didn't have to be. I appreciate that very much. Um, so there are kind of three things that happen with regard to the tomb of Christ. Um, all part of the resurrection of Jesus as we get into the rest of the exaltation. Uh, first of all, there's something that's not in the creed. He comes to life again. And, and that's just assumed in the creed. Uh, and maybe along with Rose again, but that, that um, I call it the revivification. If you revive somebody, they are revived 
And what did I just perform? The revivification, which I think mouth to mouth is easier to say probably, uh, or whatever we would do hand compressions, but um, uh, Jesus came to life again, then he descended into hell, and what did he do there in hell? Yeah, he proclaimed his victory over the devil and the others who are there. It's sometimes even called the harrowing of hell, the terrifying of hell. He went down there to say, I won. Um, and then he rose again from the dead, which is either Jesus going back into the tomb with a closed stone, it's not rolled away yet, and then out, or he just didn't go back up into the tomb and he went out. And I'm not going to argue with anybody about which of those two things happened because I don't know. What I do know is that when the angel rolled away the stone, it was to show the empty tomb, not to give Jesus an exit. And we see that in the Gospels where Jesus shows up in closed rooms. Uh, the, 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 the ten are in the upper room and the door is closed and locked and suddenly Jesus is among them and says, peace be with you. A week later, Thomas is with them, so the eleven are together, closed room, locked door, Jesus appears and says, peace be with you. And a few weeks later, they're out fishing on the Sea of Galilee and all of a sudden a guy shows up who didn't travel there with them with a fire of coals and fish are sort of broiling there, I think, and, and, and it's Jesus, and how did he get there? He just shows up. So he, um, one aspect of Jesus' resurrected body is that it is illocal. Illocal, which has three L's, I-L-L-O-C-A-L, that's all right, illocal, um, means he doesn't have to be anywhere, but he chooses to be somewhere. Um, and But he can be there and then over here again. So uh, he can jump around, um, and he does. Uh, he does show up here and show up there. But it's also comforting for us to know that where he is, he has chosen to be. So in heaven, where he also is illocal, but you see him in heaven when you are, maybe when your soul is there, but certainly when your body and soul reunite and you are in heaven and you see Jesus there, some comfort you might take from that is that he has chosen to be there with you. We're going to talk more about the resurrected Jesus in a little bit. But his resurrection, it, oh, we didn't finish the creed, did we? So descended into hell. Third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and from there he will come to judge the living and the dead. And there's a difference in the resurrection of the living, or of the believing, rather, and the resurrection of the unbelieving. We'll talk about that um, in, a, in a little bit, but tonight. Um, and Romans uh, helps us with this statement that his resurrection is part of the activity that earned our salvation because Paul says, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. So the resurrection is part of his saving activity. Not that he earned our salvation um, only partway on the cross and finished it in the, in the resurrection, but the resurrection is part of what um, telegraphs this to us. What he has done is accepted to God. God has smiled. So listen up. God, that, that, that's what the resurrection is. Notice how God has approved of what his son has done. So that's part of the gospel. Second, the cause of Jesus' resurrection, and, and I really appreciate this, the son rose from the dead, the father raised the son from the dead, and the Holy Spirit made him alive again also. So all three persons of the Trinity taking part also in this, the resurrection of Jesus, and we can take great comfort from the fact that the persons of the Trinity never do anything without the approval and complete agreement of other persons. 
So the spirit might do something the father and son have not done. He entered me at my baptism. The son might do something that the father and the spirit did not do. He took on human flesh. The father may have done something that the son and the spirit have not done. He begat the son. But all three are in agreement in all of those. Um, so the, there, there is no dissent in the union. And I sometimes use that as an illustration of how we should act in our marriages. So the, do you think that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit arguments over what we're going to do tomorrow or something? You know, they don't. And they never talk about each other like Jesus comes to earth and says, you know what the Father told me the other day? You know, or do you know what the Holy Spirit actually did the other day? It's just, no, they're constantly building each other up. What does the Father say about the Son? This is my Son. Listen to him. And what does the Son say about the Father? I, I never do anything that the Father has not given me to do. And the Holy Spirit does nothing but inspire people to talk about the Son constantly and go out into the world. So they're always building each other up. And that's the way husbands and wives should treat each other. Always building each other up behind closed doors and when we're out of each other's company, but also in, in, in mixed company, whatever it is, building each other up all the time. Do we fail? I do. Anybody else fail at that? I do. Uh, but we ask God to forgive us and we move forward and we learn from that. But yeah, okay. A couple of things from some old, old Lutherans. Um, our theologian, as if he were here, uh, uh, back in the late 1500s, 1580 or so, uh, one of the authors of the formula of Concord was Jacob Andrea. I think I don't have enough A's in his last name. Just throw one in anywhere. Um, and he said, Christ, according to his human nature, has the power to resuscitate himself. Uh, that one made a couple people go ballistic. Um, and they were all enemies of the Lutheran church. Um, Andrea, I think, said it provocatively because so many were saying in those days that the nature, uh, that Christ, according to only his divine nature, rose. And Andrea said, no, he rose according to both natures. And he actually went back and said, According to his human nature, he has the power to resuscitate himself, to rise from the dead. And part of the reason that he said that is because um, we know that there is no aspect of the divine nature that has not been included in the human nature. And there is no part of the human nature that has not been taken up into the divine nature. So what Jesus did according to his human nature died on the cross. He did also according to his divine nature. So what's the, the hymn? Oh, sorrow, dread, God's son is dead. Yeah. Um, and uh, factual statement? Yeah. Uh, terrifying statement. Uh, brings a tear to my eye on Good Friday statement. Yeah, um, if, I, if, I, if I see we're about to sing that one, I might step out for a moment. Um, uh, but uh, in the proof passage, simply put your finger here. <laughs> Andrea just reaches right to the heart of things. Uh, reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Was Jesus risen according to his human nature as well as his divine? Yeah, nail prints in my hands, guys. So that's all that Andrea has to do. And uh, I don't know if I would have said that, but I don't disagree with why he said it or the, or the proof passage that he uses. So fascinating uh, moment in sort of Lutheran church history back in, back in 1580. Since Jesus rose according to his human nature as well as his divine nature, we see that his two natures are still present in the resurrection and therefore, for all eternity, what one nature has, so 
as the other. Now, uh, now the question is, or my application is, when I in heaven see Jesus and run up to him, I'm sorry, I'm going to knock you all over running up to Jesus. So just, I'm sorry now. Um, uh, uh, what color eyes will Jesus have? This is a classic theological question. Because um, some people would answer, Why, whatever eyes you need him to have. And I think that's bunk, because I think Jesus has risen according to his human nature. Therefore, he has whatever color eyes Mary saw when she was nursing her baby boy. That's the color eye he has because his human nature is risen in heaven. Um, I, will he, um, oh no, that's a silly question. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go there. But, um, but Jesus will look the way he looked. And does he still have the nail prints? I've had, thank you, Brad. I've, I've had some people kind of question that and say, well, no, he's perfect, but the nail prints are not imperfections. What do we call the nail prints? Proof. Or, trophies. Sorry, I just got a trophy for never having gotten one. I don't really know how to hold them, but uh, so, okay. It's, uh, <laughs> I maybe got a participation trophy once for something. I don't remember. But, uh, um, but uh, yeah, proof or, or a trophy, something that we can see that, that shows that he actually did do what he did. In Revelation, there's a curiosity here because sometimes we see the lamb on the throne and sometimes we see the lamb on a book with seven seals and sometimes we see the lamb looking as if it had been slaughtered or sacrificed. So uh, I'm willing to ask the question, will Jesus always look the same? Or some, on, on the one hand, will he look like he did on earth? And on the other hand, will he look like he done, uh, did on the cross? Well, the sacrifice is done and, and, and over with, so I don't think he needs to look sacrificed like that. But I also uh, have to say, but Revelation says that. And so I appreciate that, that it says that. I'm not going to draw any doctrinal conclusions except to say, huh. But I think we should do that once in a while with Revelation. And let it, let it kind of let it say, huh. And other uh, books that are sort of apocalyptic and talk about heaven um, with regard to things like animals, where we're told the lion will lay down with the lamb and the infant will play next to the cobra's nest and there are, you know, images of maybe sheep or birds. And if the trees really are coming into flower and blooming with new fruit every month, in the Garden of Eden, what helped the trees along with their fruiting? Gardeners. Bees and stuff, right? Can you imagine bees without stingers? Bees that are friendly? Winnie the Pooh bees? You know, that I might even pet one. Maybe not. But I might. Maybe not. Maybe. Nate's been rubbing off on me too much. Okay. Uh, uh, let's go to Marty Chemnitz, as if I went to school with him. I can call him Marty. Author of Formula of Concord. Martin Chemnitz wrote a whole book. It's about that big. It's yellow. It's on Pastor Sutton's shelf. I just borrow his because it's expensive. So um, it's called The Two Natures of Christ. And one of his conclusions is the whole majesty, power, and activity are united personally with the human nature, the humanity of Christ, and dwelling in it in such a way that they shine forth in the assumed nature and work with it and through it. Um, and for, uh, let me get the, for this presence, of Christ's assumed human nature, of which we are now speaking, is not a natural or an essential presence, I'll come back to those phrases, but 
a voluntary and wholly free presence which depends only on the will and power of the Son of God. So, not uh, an essential presence. Was the Son of God divine and complete before he took on human flesh? Yes. So, not part of his essence. Um, naturally, would the Son of God take on human flesh? No, it was a choice he made. So, not a natural or an essential presence, but, and here's gospel in Chemnitz's words, a voluntary presence. The, the Son of God chose to come down and take on our flesh and be here with us. And a wholly free presence he could have chosen to get out of it at any given moment. He could have called down the legions and put a stop to it and all of that, but he didn't. He let it all happen. And it all happens only on the will and power of the Son of God. What Jesus did, he did voluntarily, freely, completely, and thoroughly for our sakes, just because he loves us. Not because of anything he saw in the future in us but simply because in eternity he chose us and loved us and still loves us. Okay, uh, one last big passage here. For in Christ, the typo, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. That's Colossians 2.9. That is an amazing scripture passage. And we have our kids memorize it, not only in seventh and eighth grade catechism, but in fifth and sixth grade catechism, it's on the syllabus for the kids to memorize. That's a pretty deep passage, isn't it? But all the fullness of the deity. And why do we have them learn that? Well, because there are religions, denominations out there that say that Jesus was a son of God or like God or something. But what does all the fullness of the deity tell me about Christ? It's everything, yeah, in every way. Um, sometimes I teach our children a, a fast-forward way of remembering the order of the books of the, of the, of the New Testament. So uh, my claim is that in under five minutes, I can teach you how to say everything from Matthew to Revelation in the correct order and never forget. Have I done this for you? Have I? I'm going to do it again for some of our readers at home. They're not. Um, and that is, first of all, can you get me out to 2 Corinthians? Can we do that far from Matthew? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, right? Then how do I remember the order is the problem here. And so I use the phrase, Grandma eats purple crayons for Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. And they come back to that. But then it's just the five T's. You're not. Order, and they get shorter. First and second Thessalonians, first and second Timothy, Titus. Is there coffee in heaven? Why? Philemon, he brews. Yeah, okay. Dumb joke, but Philemon brews. He brews. But two, three, four, you're done. So one James, two Peters, three John. Jude has four letters. Revelation, you're done. We just did it, right? You get to Corinthians, Corinthians, purple crayons. Five T's, Philemon, Hebrews, one, two, three, four, you're done. That's the New Testament. Back to Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. I just want to, um, there's a reason behind those words I chose. Grandma, uh, who, I, I, in the book of Galatians, there are two grandmothers that are spoken about, Hannah and Sarah. And which of those grandmothers is your ancestor? Are you the child of the slave woman? Or the child of the free woman. This is a big deal in Galatians. This is over the others, although, well, Philippians, uh, Lydia and Philippi was a dealer of what kind of cloth? Purple, purple. But the crayons is the important one of all of those, actually, because of this passage uh, of, of, of the fullness of the deity lives and all the fullness of the deity lives. In How many colors are in a box of crayons? And I hope your answer is all of them. 
Yeah, were you going to say 84 or something like that, or 16? It's all of, or eight. You didn't get, I'm so sorry. Joanne, when's Herb's birthday? <laughs> He's getting the big box of 64 this year. Yeah. Uh, um, but all, all the colors of the rainbow, um, all, all the fullness of the deity, every single aspect of what it means to be God is there in Christ. Okay. You've been listening to Invisible Church, the Bible study podcast from St. Paul's Lutheran Church, New Orleans, Minnesota.